everybody. Welcome back to the Pacific War Podcast, week by week in association with Kings and Generals. I am your dutiful host, Craig Watson, and I'm joined here today by Dave Holland. How are you, Dave? Uh, not bad, Craig. Thanks for um, having me on. It's a, it's a privilege. And uh, today's subject is going to be about the Guadalcanal campaign, something that was of deep interest to me, especially uh, from actually the Japanese point of view, in which Guadalcanal was kind of a hellish island where they were sent with almost no food or rations and they suffered tremendously in the jungles to terrible diseases as well as being uh, well killed by the marines so it's quite a uh, quite uh, a horror show for both sides but I, I think the Japanese got it even worse than most and uh, if you want why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, yeah all right thanks yeah I'm um, uh, um... Originally from the United States, you can probably tell from my accent, even though it's a it's a hybrid accent between um a little bit Australian, the, the, yeah, the Southern United States and Australian. Um, but um, originally, like I said, from the states, uh, I did eight years in the U.S. Marines and um, lived permanently in Australia. You know, courtesy of an Australian wife. Um, so the reason I became uh, interested in Guadalcanal, um, I worked for the Australian government, and obviously being a, a military nut ever since I was about six years old or probably earlier than that. That's my only, my, I guess my earliest memory and uh, a former U S Marine. And then working for the Australian government, uh, I got a chance to visit Guadalcanal for short periods. And that was started in 2009. And, you know, you can imagine the excitement of, of going to Guadalcanal. And um, I said it before, it's been like an Australian soldier uh, being posted, you know, two years or three years to Gallipoli, you know, or, or a Canadian oh, soldier wow. being posted years to Vimy Ridge in the, in the Western Front, who, who's have a, a strong military uh, interest of history, you know, you're in your element. So all my available time, you can imagine, I spent walking the battlefields. And what I wanted to do was to delve deep into some of the, um, obviously the major battles, but also to go off to the, the side uh, battles or skirmishes. It was quite a canal with a six month campaign. And, it, you know, it was it wasn't one battle, it was a campaign, it was multi-battles and multi-skirmishes. So I wanted to delve deep in that. And I read all the, the popular history and the, and the uh, detailed history of Guadalcanal, but I wanted to put boots on the ground, walk the ground, which I think is very important, and find out exactly, did it happen this way? Did it occur this way? You know, and you know, with my military background, I could, I could look at it from, from that point of view also. And, and then I started in 2009, so I went there. And I did a four month trip and that, that allowed me to, to get, you know, to start to scratch the surface a bit, just to get excited. And then from 2011 and 12, I did short trips. And during that time there, I gave a lot of battlefield uh, study programs to the Australian army and um, Australia and uh, New Zealand and, and some of the American Marines was over there at times, battlefield study programs. I did a lot of battlefield tours, battlefield walks. But then in 2018, I've got, had the opportunity to be posted for two years of Guadalcanal. So I could really delve deep and I did some, you know, I, I went so deep. I lost my breath, so to speak, and a lot of, a lot of, um, I run out of air, so to speak, in a lot of places, but I'm, I'm tending to go back. Um, currently, uh, Guadalcanal is, is, I guess, banned for tourism, it's banned for any outside visitors due to COVID. And fortunately, COVID has just kicked over for the first time over in the in Solomon Islands. So oh, you yeah. can imagine. Yeah. That's probably earlier this year. It kicked in. So they've been closed almost three, it'll be three years. And this is the 80th, as you know, this is the 80th anniversary to Guadalcanal. And so it's going to be a big year for tourism. So hopefully the pro will make the August. I don't think it's going to be open up by August um, for the anniversary, but hopefully by the end of the year. So to answer your initial, initial question, yes, that's my interest in, in Guadalcanal. And I also run a, a, a YouTube site called Guadalcanal, Walking the Battlefield. So what basically what I've done, I made that, um, YouTube site for people who've only been to Guadalcanal, maybe for the short one week tour or the, a few days, and for the people who never go to Guadalcanal. And then I walked a battlefield. It's like giving a, a battlefield uh, a study, a battlefield tour. And I, you know, I'm doing it. And it's off the, the beaten track on a lot of these sites. And I keep updating it as we go. And I'd like to walk in the battlefield, but in the meantime, until I can go back, I, I do um, some episodes. And I also have a Facebook site same title Guadalcanal walk on the battlefields which I'd update every two or three days and I do a lot of then and now photos I try to post material that's very original that no one's ever seen before or rarely 
seen. Yeah. And I also help out authors and researchers on Guadalcanal. So that's that's my interest. Have yeah, I saw it? there there's an iconic photo of uh, I don't know if it's alligator. Oh no, it's, I don't know which battle it is. But there's a lot of Japanese dead on a beach, and you had done a walk, and you had put together the photo of you or the filming of you walking on that same beach, and you spliced it with this iconic photo. It's really it's uh, I've never seen anything like that before. It was very impressive. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have to take, I don't know if I'll take credit for the then and now. So a lot of the then and now photos comes from a, a fella in Australia. He's a good friend of mine called Peter Flahavin. And he runs a, a site too, and he's been doing it for years. And then he's been visiting Guadalcanal since the early 90s. And he does a lot of then and now. I think he probably has the world's largest private collection of Guadalcanal photos. And he's, if you've ever seen his work, he's amazing. But yeah, we, we work kind of work together. But it is the battlefields are a lot of them are preserved a lot of them have been built over but a lot of them are actually preserved too hey everyone i just wanted to let you know i now have a patreon account found at www.patreon.com slash the pacific war channel over there you can find exclusive patreon episodes and podcasts based on suggestions from patrons and other benefits like early access to all of my content live hangouts your name in the end credits and much much more so please go check it out so you can do the good then and now. That's really interesting. Mm -hmm. So uh, I guess to start this off, as I know a lot of the general audience is probably quite confused when it comes to island hopping warfare in general. But uh, I found when, when I was younger, uh, when I was in, in my teens, and I was influenced by things like uh, the Pacific series on HBO, for example, I found it kind of hard at first to grasp, like, why are these men on Guadalcanal, why the Japanese there and what's the importance of it. So uh, maybe you can uh, help explain a bit about why was there a Guadalcanal campaign? Okay, I, wanna, um, I won't delve too deep into it. Honestly, uh, you, you viewers are quite aware of, of Pearl Harbor and the reasons why we uh, or the, the Allies got into the war. But we'll put us, um, let's say, in, in early 1942 in the Solomon Islands and why the Japanese were there and why the Allies were there. Well, the Japanese, um, as you know, um, they were expanding quite rapidly. And because they had the victory fever after six months, they decided, well, we'll, we'll keep pushing down into the Southwest Pacific or South Pacific. And what they intended to do was to uh, take Port Moresby in New Guinea and also continue on down to the Solomon Islands and then into Fiji, Samoa, New Caledonia. The main goal there was, was to cut off the supply line to Australia. And uh, the Japanese had thought if they could cut Australia off, potentially Australia could sue for a separate peace. Yeah. Uh, we know now that Australia, they had no intentions, uh, no serious intentions of invading Australia. You know, the Australian public and the New Zealand public didn't know it at the time. You know, they thought, you know, they, you know, he was coming south with that famous propaganda photo. You know, they were on war footing. They were very, very, uh, I wouldn't say afraid, but they were very concerned that the Australian or the, um, uh, the Japanese were going to invade Australia and New Zealand. But the, the um, Japanese were going to cut off uh, the South Pacific and cut off that vital supply line because that was the only way Australia was uh, um, getting supplies. And also, too, it would deny the U.S. a major staging area for a fight back. So Australia was going to be the major, major base they were going to stage out of to their fight back, especially MacArthur being the um, Supreme Commander, the fight back through the yeah, New Guinea and up and up that way to the Philippines. So if you remember in May 42, the Battle of Coral Sea, I don't know if you guys, I don't, you haven't covered that yet, I think in your series, you're getting close. Ooh, it's well, getting really close. close yeah. to it. Yes. Um, but the, the intention of the Japanese was to invade Port Moresby and take Port Moresby and they could control that airfield and that would allow them to help interdict the shipping and also to, um, to strike some of the Northern Australian um, cities and, and, and bases and airfields that the Allies had. So the Port, uh, the, uh, the Port Moors invasion was about the Coral Sea. So the Americans and the, the Australians stopped them. At the same time they were gonna hit Port Moresby, a small contingent was, was going to, um, I guess, veer off and hit a place called Tulagi. Now it brings us to the Solomon Islands. Now Tulagi was a, a British, well, the Solomon Islands was a British protectorate. So the British uh, ran Solomon Islands. Wasn't much happening in the Solomon Islands at the time, but there was, uh, had copper or coconut plantations. You know, it was a main, I guess, resource they, they exported. So basically what happened then 
was Tulagi was the capital, British capital, colonial seat of the whole the area. And the Australians in after 41, after December 41, had a small uh, seaplane base there at Tanambogo. So Tanambogo, Gavutu, and um, Tulagi were all little islands uh, very near each other. So the Japanese decided the same time they were hitting Port Mozu, they would take Tulagi. Now, by taking Tulagi, what that would provide, one, it provide a, a coverage for their Western, um, I guess they covered their, yes, their Eastern flank yeah. or to cover the Japanese left flank and also to provide a future um, staging area for advance down um, to the rest of South Pacific. Because Tulagi had a, it still does, obviously, it has a large uh, fleet anchorage. Mm -hmm. You could put a large fleet in there. It's one of the best uh, anchorage in the South Pacific. So, <clears throat> So obviously the, um, I won't put the spoiler out there, or this is a spoiler, the, they didn't win the Battle of Coral Sea. And they were turned back. So the Japanese had to hit Northern um, New Guinea and go over the Kokoda uh, Trail or Kokoda Track as some people call it. So they landed at and and came over to the fight. But they still held Tulagi. Um, and the Australians and the, and the British, uh, I guess, fled very quickly. They left behind a few coast watchers. And I'm trying not to delve too, deep in the details. So the Americans, after the Battle of Midway, um, <clears throat> the Battle of Midway gave the Allies, uh, I guess, uh, a, I guess a push to start some offensive operations. Yes, yeah, like the um, turning capability to do offensives, yeah. Yes, I mean, it wasn't, it, it's arguable, some people say it's the turning point. For me, a, a, a turning point of a campaign is when str the strategic initiative shifts yeah. But after Midway, the strategic initiative did not shift in the Pacific because the Japanese were well on the offensive. Still, yeah, they were still, they were still much pushing more the south, as you know, in the South Pacific. Because um, you had, you know, it wasn't until the late October, November, that the Japanese um, stopped their offensive operations on Guadalcanal. Because Guadalcanal, and I'll get to in a second, was a, a Japanese offensive operations, even though the, the Allies started the offensive, but they went quickly to the defense. But <clears throat> so... Admiral King, which is the chief of naval operations, you know, he wanted to uh, have a limited offensive. Even before Midway, he wanted to have a limited offense, offensive in the, um, the Pacific. They started with some carrier sweeps in the Pacific and did some raids, but that gave them a little bit of a, I guess, uh, the shift in, in Midway gave them a bit of a chance to um, push their offensive ahead of time. So you had the 1st Marine Division. Um, they were coming to New Zealand, and they were coming to New Zealand for a couple of reasons. One, to garrison the island, because you can remember all the Aus, um, Australians in New Zealand, their main troops were fighting over in Europe. And the whole second um, New Zealand division was, at that time, probably uh, 41, 42, 40, it was fighting in North Africa. Yeah, it's a North African <laughs> campaign, yeah. So they had the militia, yeah, they had the militia there. So one, they were going to garrison, and two, they were going to train for six months and to, to become the... Um, the first striking or the main striking point for the for the allies so once they landed they landed with the first contingent which is the the uh, a regiment and the headquarters element and they had another regiment uh, at the sea coming and their seventh marine regiment was was garrison samoa at the time so admiral king told admiral nimitz who was the the head admiral in the, in the pacific basically oh, i want you to go on the offensive and then he gave him the date of one august I won't go into too much detail here, but basically what it is that set the stage for Guadalcanal. The initial, um, initial operation was going to call it Operation Pestilence. It was called Operation yeah. Pestilence, in the fact, and that was the, they were going to take um, Tulagi to surrounding islands, and then the Marines were going to hit Bougainville, then they're going to hit Rabaul. Um, and then Operation Watchtower was going to be the Tulagi and the surrounding islands. Now, initially, like I said, it was Tulagi and the surrounding islands because of the um, Japanese... Uh, um, seaplane base but when i mentioned the co uh, coast watcher guys they left behind they left behind a couple or three of them on guadalcanal one of them was martin clemens and yet between martin clemens um and his native scouts they worked out the japanese were building or seen the intel they sent out the japanese were building an airfield and how that came about the japanese were at tulagi um they were sending um, I guess, reconnaissance parties over to Guadalcanal to get cattle because before it was um, coconut plantations, like I mentioned before. So they had a lot of cattle there, obviously, to, to um, cut down the grass in the coconut plantations and also to provide some uh, beef, beef steak 
But the Japanese, you know, they were on Tulagi and they said, oh, let's go over to Guadalcanal and get some beef steak. So they started looking at, you know, um, at the beef steak and bringing the cows back. And then they started looking at the Lunga Plains and they said, we could build an airfield here, cut these coconut trees down, and we could build an airfield. And um, it would really be strategic value to us to do that. So within two weeks, they had the 11th and the 13th construction units, mainly uh, composed of um, Korean and some Japanese laborers. Yeah, the Koreans. And they started, clearing, <laughs> yeah, they started clearing the fields. And then the Coast Guard said, look, they're building an airfield here. Um, B-17s were, were doing some bombing raids there. You know, most people don't even realize that the U.S. bombed uh, the airfield to start with, with B-17s, before the Japanese could complete it. And then the reconnaissance planes picked it up. So that was the reason um, Tulagi and Surrounding Islands then became Surrounding Islands, be Tulagi and Guadalcanal to take out that airstrip because allies knew they had this unsinkable aircraft carrier with that airstrip. If they could take it, they could deny the Australians uh, to cut it off. Yep. So I probably went a bit deep in that um, setting the stage. But yeah, we're, we're there now, August 42. Well, I'll let the audience know that uh, there's actually video footage of the Japanese construction of Henderson Field. It's uh, it's pretty interesting stuff. It's uh, it's well capped too. It uh, shows kind of, uh, uh, I don't want to say a, a lack of construction capability, but certainly a disparity between the Americans and Japanese. The Japanese, it would take them a long time to build those airfields and they weren't up to a uh, well, standard, we'll say that. Yeah, they had to bring a lot of equipment in. I think they were bringing them in at the time. But we'll see later when once the Marines landed, they um they they um they loved any bit of the Japanese gear they captured from them. Yeah. Um. So I guess from this point on, some of the first battles, would you want to dwell into uh, Tulagi or Gavit? Yeah, I can. I can hit. Them? Yeah, I can talk about it briefly. So on August the seventh, the Marines were going to hit um, just like I said before, uh, Guadalcanal and Tulagi. Now, Tulagi um, had the third um, Special Naval Landing Force garrison and plus some um, construction, not construction troops, some engineers and some Japanese sailors. And Tanimbogo and Gavutu was two nearby islands, probably six, seven hundred yards away. And um, it held the air base, seaplane uh, base. So it had a lot of air personnel and a few um, support personnel there, too. It was so about 350... Island. Yeah, yeah, it had about 350 Japanese on Tulagi. Now, they were dug in. The Japanese Special Naval Landed Forces, I mean, some people call them Japanese Marines, but they weren't in the Marines um, as we, as the U.S. or the, the British Royal Marines were. Yeah, the Special they're Landing Marines. Naval Force, they're, they're the equivalent of Marines, but they're not necessarily the same as the United States Marines now. Yeah, a lot of them call them Naval Infantry. Yeah. Um, they were, they were like sailors trained to be infantrymen, and they were trained to be assault troops. And the guys on... Um, the third curry, I think they're, they're, they were the third curry because they're named after their naval base. A special naval landing force at, at Tulagi were made of mainly reservists. But in saying that, these reservists, I think the average age is in their 30s, but they're pretty switched on um, guys. If you've seen a photo of them, there's a famous photo. They're officers and NCOs, and they're all fairly um, large, large and um, you know, very capable looking fellows. Um, anyway, they dug in on Tulagi. And the Marines knew that it's going to be a hard fight at Gavutu, Tanabogo, and Tulagi. So they sent the best troops they had at the time, which was the um, Marine Raider Battalion, 1st Raider Battalion, and the 1st Marine Paratrooper Battalion, the Parachute Battalion. And they sent the 2nd Battalion, the 5th Marines, which is a, a well-trained battalion also. Um, at the time, too, they were supported by the 2nd Marines uh, Regiment. Now, you'll hear Marines talk about, and some of you re uh, viewers it can get confusing when they're reading things when uh, people refer to the second marines or the first marines or the fifth marines or the eighth marines they're not talking about divisions well in the u.s army and the other military nato forces they say you know the first you know the first infantry or the second infantry that means the division the marines when you say first marines that means regiment if they say first marine division then obviously that's division so that sometimes that can get confusing I've seen things about Iwo Jima, and they say, all oh, the 5th Marines were at Iwo Jima. And I said, well, the 5th Marines wasn't Iwo Jima. The 5th Marine Division was at Iwo Jima. So that can get confusing at times. Anyway, the 2nd Marines, 2nd Marine Regiment, was a part of the 2nd Marine Division. Well, they were given on loan to the 1st Marine Division because, like I said earlier, the 7th Marine Regiment 
was one of the core regiments of the first division was garrison um samoa at the time you know had the famous marines in it like um h.h H. hannikin and puller and Barcelona and page you know they they fleshed out this regiment with the best ncos and officers and the best troops and the best equipment to ship them out quickly thinking they were going to be the first to fight but you know ironically they weren't, weren't the first to fight they joined joined later in september but so you had the second marines there for support so they landed it the japanese expected them to land on one side of the island which is the only feasible landing bases at Tulagi, but the Marines landed on the other side of the island at Beach Blue, which had coral, coral reefs. They came over the coral reefs early in the morning, about eight o'clock on the 7th, and they had to jump out of the boats about 100 yards off the shore. Yep. They came in, not a shot was fired, it surprised the Japanese, and then basically they, they attacked across the island, had limited resistance till they got to the very um, the south, yeah, southeast end of the island, and then they hit uh, a cave complex, uh, Hill 281, and you know the fight was on for 281. So that night the Marines uh, dug in. The Japanese did some limited counterattacks, and then the Marines uh, finished them up the next day. So it was the first time the Marines or the Allies had experienced the Japanese. How the Japanese had set the stage. How the Japanese would fight um, for the rest of the Pacific campaign. You know we're dug in these caves. We're dug in these bunkers. You're gonna have to kill us all. Um, they only captured three Japanese out of 350. Now, at the same time, I wouldn't say at the same time, probably midday, then about 12 o'clock, the, the first parachute battalion um, attacked uh, Gavutu. And they attacked Gavutu. Gavutu is a very, very small island. Anton and Boba, a very small island. So the first Marine um, parachute battalion hit it head on. And that was the first opposed landing any Marines had in World War II. You know, and they were pinned down on the, the Lever Brothers was the coconut plantation owners. Uh, I guess, corporation before the war. So that was where the headquarters was based at, Lever Brothers. So if you look on some of my, my YouTube videos, I've got uh, Tulagi and Tanimbogo, and it shows the wharf. The wharf remnants are still there. Oh. Anyway, they, they were pinned down there for a while, and they ended up, um, after a hard fight, they got, had to get reinforced by the 2nd Marines. They sent a uh, battalion from the 2nd Marine Regiment in to support them. And then the, the next day, they attacked Taz, uh, Tanimbogo, and there was a concrete causeway that connected both of them. The Marines tried to do a, a small amphibious assault by a rifle company the day before on the 7th. They were beaten back. That the was next a controversial day they... decision, too, that one. Oh, I think it was yes. Rupertus who sent uh, the unit, and it was one company, wasn't it? Or... It was about, uh, yeah, a reinforced company. Yeah. And, yeah, and they, yeah, they got hit and had to, to pull back. And then the next day, they, they had a concentrated effort, you know, with um, close fire and supporting fire on Tanimbogo and they charged across the uh, causeway. And I'm, you know, I, could, I could talk just you know, on yeah. this alone, but yeah. then it had two tanks and the two tanks uh, supported to um, M3 Stewart's. They supported and they were actually taken out. There was one scene where the Japanese had stopped it. Um, I think they threw a, a, a pipe or a bar in its tracks and stopped it. And then all the about 30, 40 Japanese, just like, like ants just jumped on top of it and was, you know, yeah. pulling his crew out and bashing them to death and trying to burn it. And the Marines had to, you know, um, I think some naval gunfire and knocked a few of them off too. But anyway, they, after two days of hard fighting, um, Tulagi, Tanimbogo and Gavutu uh, were taken. But the same time in, in August the 7th, the 1st Marine Division um, at uh, 8 o'clock in the morning was landing on Beach Red or Red Beach which is about six, a thousand, six or 8,000 yards away from Lunga Point when the airfield. So region of Marines picked that area. Um, the Marine intelligence basically told them that Japanese, there were probably three to 4,000 Japanese there and it was a whole Japanese infantry regiment. And they were gonna be dug in on Lunga Point. That's where the Marines wanted to hit was Lunga Point because it was, uh, Lunga Point is right above uh, the airfield and they could hit it and take the airfield quickly. Yeah, you get the so point, you get the airfield. Yes, and it was a it was a good beaches to land on. All the beaches there are quite quite good. So they picked about six thousand yards to the east at Red Beach, and the reason they kind of picked it was they thought it was going to be undefended. They didn't really want to hit there, but it was hit them where they're not, so to speak. That was the saying. It was a very inflated beach. I mean, it's it's like a concave. It's like that. Hmm. So it's not the best place to do amphibious invasion because you could yeah. put guns here and guns here, and you could just inflate the beach. But luckily for the Marines, when they landed, it was without firing a shot. If you ever see the movie, uh, the 
the HBL Pacific. Yeah, they're very surprised oh. that they're not seeing any resistance. They even go a little bit further in, they're not fine. Well, they find some of the equipment the Japanese left, but yeah. Yes, and I think the only casualty, I still haven't confirmed it. I mean, you read it in all the reports that was a, a Marine cut his hand on a coconut, the only casualty. I think that was shown in I mean, the Pacific too. Yeah. It probably did. I mean, it's, I don't know if it's an urban myth, but it is probably true because I've read it on numerous uh, yeah. accounts. But so that was that was August the seventh. So they've landed, and so at this stage, you had about eleven thousand Marines um, on Guadalcanal, and you had about five, about, roughly about five, four to five thousand on um, the other islands of Tulagi and kind of uh, Vaguvu to Tanambogo. All right. So they landed. Marines are on Guadalcanal. Yep. So they landed, and um, <clears throat> they were supposed to. They wanted to really take the airfield on the first day. They didn't. So the 5th Marines moved down the coast. They got as far as Alligator Creek, Ilu River. On their maps, their maps were pretty bad. Um, they had maps uh, drawn basically from reconnaissance photos and also from the knowledge of the former planters and, yeah. and um, yeah. British colonial officers. You know, for example, they, if you look at the original map, and I've seen the original map they had, you know, they gave out to the troops. They had the Grassy Knoll, which is Mount Austin. You know, it was like 1600 yards away but it was something like three or four miles away if you go there to Guadalcanal you look at it and it, it dominates the airfield and they, they never reached it well they reached it later in campaigns but the marines kind of let it go so the first marine regiment punched in a bit and they were supposed to take the grassy you no know, but they got caught up in the, um, the swamps and the jungle and basically they, they were recalled back the first uh, the fifth marines were supposed to push across Elu river alligator creek and um, because they were green troops and some of their commanders, like the regiment commander, he was a, he was a good commander, but he was old and a bit slow. Wasn't as aggressive as some of the younger guys. So I think the division commander had to come up and, and push him a bit. So the next day they took, took the airfield. Um, a few sporadic sniper fires, but they'd surprised the Japanese. The Japanese actually thought the Marines were landing. It was a raid. And that's why you know, <clears throat> the stories, they left the, the safes open. They left everything it is. Think the Marines would come in and grab it and run like a, a amphibious raid so they all uh, moved to the jungle i just waiting waiting the marines out they said they'll leave the next day and we'll go back to our camps but you know marines stayed for for years so to speak the japanese fled west so they ran to the jungle and fled west there was there were some combat troops there there were a guard company might have been two guard companies but the, most of them were construction troops and a lot of them um i don't know exactly how many but it had to be over a thousand were korean laborers and the Marines called them termites. The Japanese called them a certain name, but obviously they weren't treated that well by the Japanese. Yeah, they were uh, from, I mean, the way the Japanese command works, it's the highest ranking officer abuses the people under him. They abuse the people under them. And then when it goes down the pyramid, it's the Korean laborers who get beaten or POWs. Uh, better yeah, found. yeah, the pecking order, so to speak. Yeah, it's more because. You read a lot of the POWs, like you said, they, their accounts are the Korean guards. Because the Japanese said it was beneath them to guard POWs. So they used the Taiwan, the, the Formosans, and the, the Koreans. You know. The uh, Koreans were the most likely, even though even they didn't surrender often, to surrender. Well, they didn't have a choice to surrender. A lot of times they tried to surrender, probably <laughs> shot out of sight. Another thing, too, the Marines initially, um, if you've seen any POW, there's a lot of POW photos in the initial days of Guadalcanal. And we call them like, you know, the beach caps in Australia, they call them the giggle caps or the, you know, the bush caps. You'll see some photos of some guys in like that. If you ever see those photos, they're generally the, the Korean laborers. But a lot of Koreans uh, surrendered in, in the um, 1940s. You know, they'd labeled them all Japanese POWs. They didn't say Korean POWs, Japanese POWs. And um, like Sewell and a few of the other uh, Marine photographers, some of their photos that were coming back. They still label to this day Japanese POWs, and most of them are Koreans. And you'll see, and they use the Koreans. I'm trying to get a little sidetrack here. Um, they use the Koreans for a lot of burial parties and working parties. Once, yeah. Yeah, and the Koreans, it was said, if you read the, uh, speaking to one veteran, the, the Koreans loved burying the Japanese in the burial parties. They loved, you know, and there's, right, I've got some photos. I got some photos of the Koreans actually burying the Japanese, Alligator Creek and Coffin Corner. They're assisting the Japanese uh, whole burial parties. Wow. And I guarantee you can see some of them laughing because obviously the way they were treated 
by the Japanese. There was no love lost. No, they so, were starved and beaten. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, and some of those poor guys tried to surrender to the Marines from their beginning, but, you know, the Marines, especially being green troops, and um, they wouldn't, wouldn't taking any um, any you know, precautions, so to speak. Some of these poor guys got shot out of hand, you know, but then they worked out that let's capture some of these guys, you know, almost the, they got a bit of control of the Marines, not saying the Marines were undisciplined or anything, but you can imagine in a very um, tense situation like that, especially at night. Yeah, they got their um, hands on uh, a warrant officer, I think, who ended up yeah, that's the, some intelligence. Yeah, that's the Getty Patrol. You know, that's mm -hmm. another one I could do a whole episode on. I plan to do one. I'm working on one for my channel now, oh. the Getty. Um, so, yeah, so it brings us to the Marines dug in. They formed the horse shape, um, about a 15-mile perimeter, or 18-mile horseshoe shape perimeter. It wasn't a full perimeter on uh, Linga Point because they didn't have enough troops for that. So they... They had troops on the east, west, and the in the front frontage, which is the amphibious assault. They're being Marines, they're expecting the Japanese to do an amphibious assault with a counterattack. They knew the Jap Japanese would counterattack very quickly. Um, so they they beefed up their east flank, west flank, and the, the Lunga Point flank. But they left the southern flank basically uh, unguarded. I mean, I wouldn't say completely unguarded. They had outposts on their southern flanks and they also had roving patrols, but they didn't have enough troops to to do a full uh, 360 perimeter. It wasn't until like September the 18th when the 7th Marine Regiment landed that Archer Vandegrift, who was the division commander, had enough troops to do a full uh, garrison. So the main, initially when the Marines landed, that was the first offensive by the U.S. in World War II, the first offensive action, 7th of August. But as soon as they landed, they became defensive. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the Japanese were on the offensive, still on the offensive in that time. So once the Marines landed, they took defensive, took something, and they dug in, and they waited. And the whole objective, in fact, um, you could probably say for the six-month period, one of the most um, and most important piece of terrain in the whole South Pacific was Henderson Field, the unsinkable aircraft carrier. Because the Americans ever lost it, I, you know, it was highly doubtful they would uh, retain Guadalcanal. Because once they landed some planes there, but and it it bring it brings me up the Bloody Ridge, I guess, or sorry, um, Alligator Creek. Yeah, of course. So the Marines, after about a week, they completed the airfield. The Japanese uh, had almost completed it. In fact, they were having a bit of a party the night before. It's kind of a, you know, a, a completion party. Well, that's what some of the Marines said. There was enough sake and beer um, when the Marines landed, and as soon as the Marines landed the warehouses, they put Marine guards. Uh, very quickly on those to keep you know keep the, the sock in the beer um, I bet under, they did, yeah. The wrap. yeah but <clears throat> that brings me to a point where the marines i won't talk about Bala Sabo island because that's another episode but Bala Sabo islands was probably the 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 in august the ninth was the greatest uh surface defeat in u.s naval history yeah, australian was. cruiser loss i mean they lost four cruisers and um in a period of 30 minutes. You had over a thousand sailors died in less than 30 minutes. Yep. And to put that in perspective, um, 1,600 US uh, Marines and US soldiers died in the whole, on, on land in the whole six month campaign. But in 30 minutes on August the, the 9th, 8th and 9th, you had over a thousand sailors went down in less than 30 minutes. Over 5,500 sailors, US sailors and, and Australian sailors, um, mainly U.S. sailors, died in the six-month campaign of Guadalcanal. So that's – but what happened after that, the Navy had to pull their, their ships out. Yeah, and, the and great logistical air, issue. And air cover. Yeah, they, had, they gave them – he uh, promised them two days of air cover, but he pulled out before because they'd lost a lot of air and um, fighter planes in the last couple of days and then their fuel. So they – Fletcher had already pulled out. But, but when the morning came and there was no coverage for the transport, um, Turner, the amphibious assault, Navy off, uh, amphibious assault commander pulled the, uh, the transports out. So it left, the, and it, when the transports left, a lot of the Marine supplies left with them because Marines had, they'd combat loaded because once they reached New Zealand, they had to reload their ships and they combat loaded as best they could. They'd leave a lot behind. Um, they combat loaded um, enough supplies for 60 days worth of food and four days worth of fighting uh, or ammunition and, and things for fighting, sustained fighting. So when they pulled out, they reckon they only had about 30 days of rations, if that, and probably about two days of, of, of fighting 
full on fighting. They call it units of fire in those days. So luckily for them, and you hear anyone's read anything about Guadalcanal, they talk about how the, the Marines survived on the Japanese rice and Japanese supplies, which is true. The Japanese left tons of rice, tons of, of, of tin fish and, and, and other things. And they left a lot of um, equipment. A lot of it was in pretty bad repair, but um, I've got a list of all the stuff that the Marines um, captured, I guess, from the Japanese construction equipment. The Marines were able to unload one, offload one bulldozer. And that bulldozer, I don't know if it's called Old Faithful, and I forgot the name of it, but they, they used it a lot. And they, they used some Japanese bulldozers and, and rollers and stuff. Between the Marine pioneers and the engineers, and the pioneers are like combat engineers, um, they completed the run when, uh, runway after about a week. So now they had to wait for airplane. And so on August the 20th uh, was a good day for the Marines because the first two Marine um, squadrons landed. They had a squadron of um, Wildcats and a squadron of dive bombers. And they both landed. And in fact, a division commander met them at the uh, airfield. Kind of high-fived them when they came off, I guess you could say. Yeah, I think it was <laughs> Enterprise them the that brought them. So 12 Sorry? Dauntless or uh, 14 Wildcats, 12 Dauntless. I, I think, think it was about 30, 30 planes all up. Yeah. yeah. And that was um, Smith. <laughs> yeah, Smith and Magnum and the rest of these guys. Um, so they landed. Uh, at the same time, then the Japanese... Uh, their intel, which and the Marines suffered from, the U.S. suffered from this too, the lack of intel. That was one of the, I guess, common themes in the Guadalcanal campaign. So the Japanese intel uh, basically stated there's probably about 2,500 to 3,000 Marines. It was a raid. Obviously, they're, they're going to hit. They didn't leave, but they just take this airfield with a small amount of Marines going to hold it. So you can imagine at that time, the Japanese had not been real defeated. I mean, they've had a few setbacks in, um, you know, Malaya and, and the Bataan and in a few other places, you know, as you guys covered in your, in your series already. Um, I seen your series the other day and it was, it was in um, the Philippines where they wiped out two Japanese but infantry battalions. And I said, oh, I didn't, didn't think the Japanese had lost that much, but yeah, it wiped out two whole battalions. So yeah. it's something you don't read much about. But the Japanese, I put it uh, back what I was talking about, the Japanese had never suffered any um, major setbacks or major defeats. Um, so they're on the roll, so to speak, and had that victory fever. Victory disease was rampant in them. Yeah, exactly. And they underestimated, you know, the intel underestimated their opponents. Um, so they thought, well, they're holding a large perimeter. There's only about two, two to 3,000 of them we can easily punch through. So I had a unit called the, uh, the 28th Regiment, which is one of their best assault units. And the 20th Regiment was slated to go into Midway. They were supposed to invade Midway. Um, and uh, Colonel Achiki was their commander. And he was a pretty good commander too. If you ever read the Marco Polo incidents and stuff, he was involved in the Marco Polo incident in 37. Yeah. He was one of the commanders on the scene. He was one of their infantry um, instructors. So he was rated very high. Um, so... Let me just get this right. They went to, after, they didn't get to invade Midway, so they went to... Fortunate for them. Guam, yeah. They Either they're on Guam, I think Guam or Truk at the time. I think it might have been on Guam. It was Guam, yeah. Yeah, they're getting orders to go back to Tokyo. And the, the Japanese 17th Army, which was based in Rabaul, remember, they were fighting, their main objective was at Port Moresby. They're fighting on yeah. Kokoda. They're fighting for Port Moresby. They, the Army didn't really want to deal with Guadalcanal because they thought, we don't want to get sidetracked the 17th army commander so they said what units do we have now not to deviate from the units we have in, in new guinea and they said well we've got the 28th regiment i'll send those guys down so the, the cheeky took his best guys and formed the um, the first echelon about a thousand a little over a thousand men they put them on fast transports and they shot them straight down to uh, tabu point which is in the um, eastern side of guadalcanal yeah, they, they they used destroyers for this because they had to get them over so fast. They had very few days worth of rations. It was a real quick deal. Yeah, because they thought, well, you know, we'll, we'll take these guys. Well, they gave the cheeky land at Tabu Point. They gave him the, these. His orders were basically to either make an assessment. If you think you could take it, take it. If not, wait to your es second echelon. Another five or six hundred guys will be landing. He had some of his artillery and heavy guns in the second echelon. Just wait for them and do a concentrated attack. The cheeky landed, 
they did his uh, reconnaissance. I won't go into too much in detail about a patrol called the Brush Patrol with the Marines attacked and killing a lot of their officers. Anyway, they made the assessment and a cheeky, uh, we don't really know what he was thinking at the time. Um, Japanese infantry tactics at, the, at, at that stage um, basically um, pushed for a night assault, infiltration technique, uh, techniques, you know, the old bamboo spear uh, tactics where they just run straight in with a bamboo, yeah. um, or sorry, bamboo, with a, with a bayonet and attack a concentrated point. And they also use infiltration tactics, like I said, if they could go around it, they would. And um, I love to get they, around the units and surprise them. Yeah. Yeah. That was what they did. And I, I quite it like I was taught many years ago in the Marines about maneuver warfare. It's just like if you take water and pour it down a hill, it takes the path of least resistance and goes uh -huh. around an obstacle. And that's, that's what you do. Unfortunately, they, you know, they didn't decentralize the command with the Japanese um, NCOs and, and junior officers. Once they got the command to, this is your assault plan, they didn't have anything like we do now with the commander's intent or the Western forces where, you don't give that initiative to the junior leaders because on the battlefield, things could change very quickly, you know, and you need to have that initiative to go, okay, my commander's intent to do this. So I'm going to push toward that goal, you know, with a, especially the Japanese um, army at the time, they said, take that hill. They will take that hill no matter what cost, you know, they won't go around the hill, whatever they might want infiltration, but if whatever their last orders are, that's what they'll do. Assault that hill. They will assault the hill. But anyway, um. Alligator Creek or Ilu River, you know, on the Marine maps at the time it's called the Teneru River, mis mislabeled. Um, the Marines had had some intel that the Japanese were coming. They knew the Japanese regular army was there. Like I said before, the, um, the Brush Patrol was a, named after a, a Marine captain who ambushed the Japanese down the track. I mean, the Japanese didn't expect the Marines to do active aggressive patrolling, so they ambushed the a Japanese patrol killed a number of officers and they found out that these guys are very fresh in the Japanese regular army. They hadn't seen any regular army at that time. They're, they're here. Um, <clears throat> then you had some Solomon Island scouts. I'll put a plug in for the Solomon Islanders. Um, I know the family of this fellow is called Jacob Vuza. He's a very, very fine. He's most famous Solomon Islander, Sir Jacob Vuza, I should say. Um, and the area when it's read the Guadalcanal campaign knows about Vuza. You know, the statues of Vuza is there. He was a former, uh, British colonial uh, police officer, sergeant major in the police force, and just retired, Busa. And um, he started working for Clemens, and he was started doing uh, uh, scouting behind the lines. Anyway, he was captured too at one stage by the Japanese, and they the bayonet him tied to a tree and beat him up quite bad, and said, "Look, give us the tell us about the the Marines." There's a few accounts on it, but the the, the account it seems to ring the truth is that they untied him and they had, well, they had his hands tied, and they were. He says, I'll show you where they are. Come follow me. He knew how many Marines were there and he was leading them there. And, you know, they had him with bayonets. They'd already stabbed him in uh, a bit. But then once he got to a certain point, uh, the Marines outpost started shooting and stuff. Then they bayoneted him and he jumped into the bushes and ran. And he popped out um, the PFC called um, Bruley. Bruley seen him popping out over the, over the river. And he said, me, no Jap man, me, me, me. Me Vuza, no shoot them or something like that in Pigeon. And he was bleeding half to death. And he said, the Japanese are coming. There's a whole bunch of them. But it isn't like the old Paul Revere saying, you know, Vuza, the Marines are just sitting there doing nothing. And, you know, Vuza ran out of the jungle. Go, oh, the Japanese are coming. And then, you know, it saved the Marines. But he did give some great information that it helped. But he later became very valuable to the Marines in, um, in his scouting. You know, he, he wasn't expected to live. And Vuza always said he was like 50% American because they gave him blood transfusion. It's quite yeah, a funny I story. <laughs> I wouldn't say, wouldn't say funny story, but Martin Clemens, when they brought Vuza in, he gave the information. He's laying there, and they thought he was dying, so they had him outside the hospital or, or a tent or something. And they've called for Martin Clemens, and they said, "Oh, one of your men's here." And he goes, "I'll, I'll be with him at least to his end." You know, and he goes, "Oh, you know," he started asking. He says, "Tell me," and he says, "I'll basically my last testament." Okay, and he's tell me, and he, you know, tell Aunt so and so and tell uncle so-and-so and cut and, so and, and he started talking more and more and more he says well maybe he's not dying and he says can we get this guy to the hospital so i got him to the hospital and i started getting blood transfusion so he gave him american blood so to speak and he used to say he was 50 percent american and saved him but he really became very valuable especially during the um long patrol by carlson's raiders in, in november Vuza.
I'm trying not to, to get very detailed here, but I could go off on any of these little tangents and talk <laughs> about any of them. But anyway, bring you back to the Japanese. The Japanese were, um, the Marines had the outpost there. They knew the Japanese were coming down. What the Marines, um, three or four days before the second battalion, uh, the, the first Marine regiment had dug in the whole battalion with two companies and had another reserve. They dug in um, on the west bank of the Alligator Creek. And they dug in, they had like coconut log bunkers, they had, they had overhead covers with sandbags, as much sandbags. They didn't have much sandbags. Because when the Marines, they only offloaded 18 uh, spools of barbed wire, the rest yeah. of them got punched away. And they used a lot of the barbed wire from the coconut plantations. They stripped the coconut plantation barbed wires and reused them. Huh. Okay. In, in fact, on the um, the sandbar, which was the only passable because they had a co uh, coastal track, uh, like a plantation track, government track, and it ran wasn't a bridge over the the Ilu River. It ran on the the sandbar, and they that was the crossing point to sandbar in any vehicles on certain times of day, obviously. And um, what the Marines did one one I guess very motivated private, I guess you could say, told his lieutenant, he goes, sir, you know, some barbed wire here off this, this old plantation barbed wire. Can I put one strand over the, um, the, the sandbar mouth? He goes, yeah, that's a good idea, private, go do it. So they did that. They put one strand, so they had one strand of barbed wire, they put about apparently um, knee high. That was a Marine secret weapon. Um, so the Japanese attacked at night. They said, what we'll do, we'll, we'll do a full on assault directly across the mouth of the river you know, bamboo spear tactics, you know, we had, they had some 70 millimeter guns, um, small uh, infantry housers, had some heavy machine guns and had their, their 50 millimeter uh, grenade launchers or knee mortars as some people call them. And they had enough there to provide some form of a base of fire against the Marine position. But the, put it, uh, to go back to what I was saying, the Marines had two reinforced companies or two companies. When I said reinforced, I had, um, heavy weapons so they had some 37 millimeter anti-tank guns and heavy machine guns and some 50 cal and they had them dug in on those bunkers all on the east bank and they were supported the marines had four battalions of artillery they had three battalions of 75 millimeter howitzers mountain howards and they had a battalion of 105 millimeters their fifth battalion was still in new zealand that was 155 millimeters but because of late they didn't bring them over until i think last of october november Anyway, they were supported, um, heavily supported, and had their, obviously had the 81 millimeter, 61 millimeter mortars all sided in. But the Japanese hadn't really hit any concentration like that. These Marines, a lot of the special guys in the 1st Marine Regiment was all joined after January of 42, so they're very young, very junior. They had good NCOs, very experienced NCOs and officers, but very junior Marines. They only had six months of training, but they're very keen. They're very young, 18, 19 years old. These guys, the Marines had the youngest uh, Per average of all the U.S. Armed Forces, I think the average age of a U.S. Army soldier was 25 or 26. The average age of a Marine was 19. All these young, motivated kids, you know, <laughs> do anything. Anyway, they had them. They had them dug in. The Japanese did that night. They did two assaults across the mouth of uh, the um, two major assaults across the uh, the mouth of the Alligator Creek. Um, now we'll go back to that barbed wire that that young motivated PFC put out. The Japanese at night was advancing. You can imagine they, they clumped them in, they're advancing across the mouth and the Marines knew they were coming. It was interesting his choice to just go straight through that from the Japanese. They really have another choice. They, you know, the, the, it was more of a title. If you look at my, um, my video on Alligator Creek, you'll see it's still just like it is today. It's a more a tidal lagoon. It's okay. fairly deep there too. It's a tidal lagoon. I mean, that's how fresh water it comes in. It's mainly a tidal lagoon. Um, so it's fairly wide there and it's, you, you wouldn't try to, you know, and there is some crocodiles in there. I think at the time of the, after the Marines were there for a while, the crocodiles left because you, know, you put a few, few thousand Marines in there, the crocodiles are not going to hang around, but you know, you hear the stories, you know, Oh, the crocodiles are eating that night. I, I don't know if that's true, but it sounds pretty cool. Um, now they attacked across uh, the mouth. And the first Japanese hit that barbed wire and, it's, and it momentarily stunned them or stopped them. They didn't know what to do. Cause you can imagine trying to run across all of a sudden you hit a barbed wire and it was like an accordion effect. The guys in the front stopped, the guys in the back hit them. And when they did that roughly at the same time and the Marines said they started, they said started yelling and jabbering and, and they didn't know what was going on. 
And that's when they opened up with a 37 millimeter anti-tank gun, you know, firing 100 and what, 128, 126 pellets of 30 cal. It'd be like 130 something um, rifles going off at the same time. Giant shotgun blast, just, just cut them down like a scythe. And then, then the heavy machine guns started opening up, the mortars and the, the rifles and the BARs and everything started just pounding. And I had some good infiltrating and grazing fire of the Marines. The grazing fire, as you know, is, is you put a machine gun about knee high and, that's, and you fire the grazing fire. That's what machine guns fire. And normally they cut, cut you down and then, then hit you in the head or the rest of your body and they, they cut you down. That's what it's designed for because you want to put your Marine, or machine guns high because it might fire high. Grazing fire is great fire and infilade fire. I mean, look at World War I. Infilade fire killed me, no, I'm sorry, me and thousands. Um, so, so the first two assaults, I mean, the first assault, they just pushed through and they, they overran a few of the Marine positions. They actually took out some of the 37 millimeter gunners and some of the Marines infantry guys who knew a little bit about, well, I think one guy knew how to fire a 37. He just grabbed some volunteers and said, jump on this 37. So obviously between that and the Marine machine guns, we're getting a lot of Japanese fire. You know, there's one story, you got um, three Marines. Um, they made a movie out of it too. It was uh, Schmidt, uh, Rivers and Diamond. Um, and um, Di or, um, yeah, maybe get to start. Rivers, Johnny Rivers was on the machine gun. They're all on a heavy machine gun crew. And he's firing. Then he gets shot and killed. And apparently he's supposed to fire another 200 rounds. And then they push him to the side. And then Al Schmidt gets on the gun. He's firing. And, and Diamond's the, the team leader. He's directing. Then, you know, obviously the Japanese were concentrating their fire on their bunker because they were killing a lot of Japanese. That was their main bunker. The Japanese had to take that bunker out. And, you know, Japanese grenades were landing left or right. Well, I think it was a Japanese grenade or a Japanese knee mortar around landed and um, temporarily, uh, or did temporarily, permanently blinded Smith. So he's, his face was... Um, he suffered wounds he couldn't see. Then I think Diamond couldn't, his arms were wounded. He couldn't fire. So uh, they became a team and they kept firing. So Diamond's with his eyes and Smith was his, was his hands. So they, you know, both earned Navy Cross. I think all three earned Navy Crosses and Johnny Rivers. And um, yeah, so they, I think it was a movie. I forgot the movie. It's actually made during the war. Um, Smith, somebody, I know it. Um, so yeah, they, so they stopped two attacks. So the, the Japanese decided what we'll do. They had some of the engineers try to go across the river at one point, but they didn't go too far. But what Achiki said, okay, well, obviously these guys are more than we expected. It's what I'll do. I'll do my third assault. It was getting toward daybreak. And instead of going across the sandbar, they went out into the ocean a bit, came down, bypassed the sandbar, was going to attack straight up the beach. Well, they ran straight into, there's a good photo I got. It shows a pillbox and it shows, in fact, there's a famous time life photo, you know, so the Japanese have buried in the, in the sand. It looks like they're sleeping. There's a famous Japanese photo or sorry, time life photo of the Japanese are in the sand. And that was the, the element that tried to attack up the beach or, or from the ocean. Sorry to come in I from the seen ocean. That photo. Yeah. So they, they, they wiped out all three assaults. Now when daylight, daylight fully broke the Japanese at that stage, uh, there's a bit of contention of how Achiki died. They said, well, I think the Japanese that came up with a great story is, you know, he was so dishonored and ashamed that he went back with his adjutant and he burned his colors and he committed. Um, Subuku. Yeah, Subuku. You know, that sounds good. But knowing that probably the leader he was and what there's been some reports, not too many Japanese lived there. This, um, they thought he probably died in the third assault, leading the third assault. I'd and imagine. He he lead the last assault because... There's a few elements that come in because after that third assault, the Japanese appeared very disorientated, very disorganized. You know, they had no leaders. I think all their leaders actually died, including the Chiki. So the Marines, they said, well, the Japanese are over there. They're not doing any more assault. We can see them across in the coconut groves. So that's when the Marine commander says, they're over there. I want to get them out. So what they did was then they took they had another battalion, basically enveloped. So they went down the creek and came up and, and cut the Japanese off and enveloped them. Then they had the Marine tank platoon come across the sandbar and then they just basically killed the Japanese. And that's what you see in the, in the Pacific series where you know, some Japanese tried to surrender and they, they blew themselves up with grenades yeah. or they tried to kill the Marines. And, and that was when the Marines first seen it, how the Japanese fought as in not surrendering. Mm. And um, 
you know, anyway, they were out of, out of like a thousand Japanese, I think only a hundred made it back. Yeah, or even not made it back. I think about 30 or 40 made it back. And they had a hundred left in the rear guard. Yeah, he left the rear guard of a hundred and he had like 30 something guys yeah. that escaped. Made it back. Yeah. And some did try to surrender, but yeah, the Marines wouldn't take any surrender because I'll, I'll mention briefly about the Getty Patrol. And the Getty Patrol was the reconnaissance patrol on August 12th um, with the division uh, lieutenant colonel, or sorry, colonel, um, intel officer. And he led this patrol and they were basically, I won't go into detail about it, because, um, but they were basically killed. And, and uh, there was a Japanese warrant officer, naval warrant officer had captured. And the story was the Japanese had a white flag and were trying to surrender. Then there was this deceitful and they ambushed the Marines and they butchered them. Now to butcher them, butchering them is fact. They did butcher them. But probably now we know that it wasn't a, a, a elaborate trick. The white flag was probably the normal Japanese flag, you know, with the, the red um, meatball, they call it the red um, signal in the middle. middle. Um, the one officer, as soon as they were landing that night, he was saying, oh, you're landing in the wrong place. You know, they, I don't want to land here. You know, these, these guys are they're pretty, because they'd, they'd uh, reinforced, uh, I think a week later with some Japanese special naval landing infantry guys and some guard company guys. And they didn't want to surrender because they thought there would be some Japanese construction troops would surrender but anyway that kind of set the stage i call it the marines blood vendetta for the rest of the pacific war because even you know if you read eugene sledge's great memoir he talks about you know even being told about this in 1944 and they probably it was like a rallying cry even in boot camp you know remember get you remember these deceitful japanese you know they're tricky so that was that set the stage for the marines with that mindset and then when you had the battle of alligator creek where these guys wasn't surrendering and even the division commander said, I've never seen troops such as these. You know, the Marine division commander, he said, these guys don't surrender. You know, they're deceitful and they're tricky. And then when they're trying to blow themselves up you know, or trying to lure the Marines in and take as many Marines out, that kind of set the stage. So after that, the Marines basically had an unwritten, unwritten rule. We're not, especially the Marine infantry guys on the front line, we're not taking prisoners. You know, they don't, they don't take prisoners and we don't take prisoners. There was no, the Japanese did take some American prisoners in Guadalcanal campaign, but they killed them shortly after that, after they, you know, uh, tortured them and tried to get some information or just, just bayoneted them just to um, make them scream and yell, just yeah, a, dis, a common tactic to, yeah. to make the other guys a bit scared, so to speak, but didn't work with the Marines. Anyway, um, after that battle, um, so the Japanese, uh, the second echelon landed of a cheeky about a week later. So the, the Japanese thought, okay, well, these are a little, this is a more serious than we thought. Um, it was the first major loss of, for the Japanese. It was an eye opener for ground forces. Yes. Um, being from being in Australia, it, it, get a quick argument about what was the first, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. land defeat in the Milne Bay, which was a week later. And so it's always arguing. Both of them, both of them were good defeats. I mean, uh, Milne Bay was the first, I guess, overall. They they say um, Alligator Creek's a local, and Milne Bay they were completely turned back, which they were. So they're both not to, to take anything away from Milne Bay or or Alligator Creek. I mean, it's one of those pride things, the thing, ego things on both sides. Uh, we had the first one. We had the first one. Um. So yeah. So. The Japanese were set back a bit. They still thought wasn't that many Marines there, and they Port Moresby was their main objective. And the Japanese Army thought, well, this is getting a bit out of hand now. We don't want to commit any more forces because we want all our reinforcements to go into PNG. But they had a brigade at that stage called the Thirty Fifth. Oh, I'll bring it back to the, um, the Air Force. Air Force, the Marines air landed on the twentieth. They actually helped out on the twenty first. They flew. Yeah, um, they the Japanese. Yeah, they strafed the Japanese Alligator Creek, so everyone got involved. In this poor Japanese, they were getting smashed by everyone. Yeah, it was Japanese who were trying to escape during the battle on a, a part of a beach, and then the Cactus Air Force came in and strafed them. Oh yeah, they they yeah they were getting everything. They were getting tanks. In fact, there was an old Marine um, gunnery sergeant, supposed to be one of the best shots in the division. He won all these uh, rifle competitions in the 30s and 20s and things. And I forgot what his name, gunnery sergeant. And when the Japanese were out in the ocean, you know, just were trying to escape, he walked up and he had his old campaign hat, like the drill instructor hat. 
he had a shooting jacket, like a, the normal range shooting jacket. And he, he stood there and he got in a nice position. He put his sling on. And um, and the guys were watching him. They go, oh, here he goes, our best shot. And a couple of first rounds he missed. And they went, oh, what's going on here? Then apparently he got his, what do they call it? He got his groove in a bit. And then he started shooting a lot of Japanese poor guys. Um, but yeah, so it set the stage and I had a 35th brigade. And you've mentioned him in some of your um, podcasts and, and YouTube, um, Kawaguchi's brigade. Yeah. Uh, I forgot the, where they were at, somewhere in the Pacific. They, they didn't, um, what was Kawaguchi, Sumatra, I think? Ooh, I'm not sure. 35th brigade. Anyway, they, they were they were trained and they were supposed they were part of South Seas detachment and they were slated to go into port <clears throat> port um or sorry on the Kokoda to reinforce they were going to be the first main reinforcements, I believe, to to assist those guys. Then anyway, we had to divert them. And they said, yeah. okay, Cow Kawaguchi had about six thousand guys. And um they were based on the based around the one hundred and twenty fourth um regiment. I'm about, to, I'm about to take a, a quick break here for a second. <laughs> no worries. Yeah, of course. I got, I got a cat that's easy to go out. And then I'll, just go I'll be right back. All right. I'm I figured you'd played some like interlude music or something <laughs> yeah um so yeah they've took the 35th brigade and kawaguchi is probably the best overall japanese commander i mean it's arguably um of the whole campaign so what they did with kawaguchi um they landed at tabu point and, they, uh, and some of his guys like colonel oka was the the vision or the regimental commander 124th him and his headquarter group another battalion landed on um, the east side, or sorry, the west side, and uh, Kawaguchi and the rest of his guys landed at Tabu Point, same place at Chiki, um, just due to shipping. So they landed, and what they were going to do is <clears throat> the reconnaissance planes were flying over, and they seen how the Marines were reinforced on the, the flanks and in the front, but they didn't have anyone in their back. And if you look at a map with, Alec, with um, Edson's Ridge or Bloody Ridge, it, it goes straight to the um, airfield. Oh, so I got a cat going crazy here. He always does this. Um, only when I'm on a podcast or something, he'll do this. Oh, I, I know full well. I have two parrots, and that's why <laughs> I've been clicking the mute button this entire podcast because they keep screaming, like my name and stuff. <laughs> well, he's got his arm coming through the door, pushing the door. It looks quite funny, making me laugh. Um, no, he's got I think, the door. Yeah, Kawaguchi was Sumatra, if I remember. I, yeah, yeah. I, I, we covered that not too long ago. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's pretty good. Um, so, so they landed in Kawaguchi's plan. And he goes, well, I know I'm going to be moving all my units through the night, typical Japanese um, tactics. And I need a, a concentrated point or a place I can move them quite quickly. And Bloody Ridge is only a thousand yards away from the airfield. And if you look at a map coming straight out of the jungle, if you hit, if they hit on top of that ridge, you could put, you know, put his thousand, a couple of 3,000 guys at that stage he had with him. You go straight down that um that that ridge. Come on, man. You got he pushed the door open. For oh, the audience, oh. I can actually see the cat now. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries. All right, I'll double lock the door. <laughs> ghost, ghost of the Japanese are coming to get me in Kawaguchi. Oh, he's a nice cat. Anyway, so yeah, uh, Bloody Ridge forms a natural line straight to the, it's like a dagger, so to speak, or a highway straight to, to the airfield. So the reconnaissance flights and the reconnaissance had picked up. This is basically undefended. They also had captured American um, army pilot like a week or two earlier, a week earlier. And they obviously tortured him. And he said the, um, he confirmed that the, the rear of the, the Marine lines were basically undefended. I think he was one of the 67th um, pursuit squadrons of the, the P-400s. Oh, I know, the I've Army never Army. heard of this. Huh. Yeah, yeah. And um, <clears throat> anyway, they the Marines had squads up there with the engineers and had a combat outpost and was fairly undefended. It's actually a good plan. So what he was going to do, he's going to 
the rest of the second echelon, uh, a cheeky, the guys that the cheeky didn't wait for, the rest of his unit, um, they call them the Bear Battalion. Uh, mainly it's heavy guns, like 37, 47 millimeter anti tanks and a few other infantry guys. They were going to hit the, the um, on the right flank, a place called the Overland Trail. I have a good video on that. It, it, um, it, um, William Barsh, a good historian, actually wrote a book about, or sorry, wrote a good article about the, I think, um, got the name of the title, but it's a good article about it. And um, Adaby uh, wrote a book too, the Battle Overland Trail. And it's very perfectly preserved. So if you go on my um, YouTube site, you'll see it. Anyway, that was going to be one diversionary attack. A second diversionary attack was going to be come from Colonel Oak and his uh, battalion, going to hit the Marines' um, western flank. So it was going to be a simultaneous attack. So there were going to be two uh, flank attacks to draw. See, once again, the Japanese thought the Marines were only had about 3,000 guys spread out over 15 miles. So that. That's why they thought they could concentrate a few thousand Japanese in one area. They'll just overrun the Marines. So two simultaneous attacks on the flank. And the main attack with um, Kawaguchi and his three battalions. So basically a reinforced regiment was going to come straight up and over the ridge, straight into the airfield and overrun the airfield. Great, great plan. But unlike most of the, the three main Japanese attack on Guadalcanal, it was uncoordinated. Uh, they underestimated the terrain, the, the jungle. I mean, contrary to what a lot of people think, Japanese wasn't you know, expert jungle fighters that people tend to, to make them. Um, They're just know, they willing to take the them. risk. Exactly. They, they did. They, they looked at it and they said, well, we can, we could do it. Potentially, we, we will do it. And, we'll, and once we commit ourselves to atta the attack, we, will, we have to keep attacking. Yeah, because you know, even though if the odds arrive, are. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot what the Japanese called it, but their doctrine says if, if especially in those early days, you know, they, they didn't even talk about defense hardly. They, there's all everything's about attack, attack, attack. Even if the odds are against us, we will still attack. That was our, you know, our doctrine, our philosophy. Yeah. Anyway, they um, they moved in. And the Marines at that stage had an undefended. So Colonel Edson and the First Raiders. They brought them from Tulagi and <clears throat> they put them in a rest area around Lunga. And there was reports that the Japanese had a, a, a supply base at um, Tabu Point at Tanimboga. And um, Edson asked the chief of staff, uh, Thomas of the 1st Marine Division, he says, look, we're raiders. Let us do an uh, amphibious assault or do a raid on their, their supply yeah. dump. So they, on the, I'm trying to think, the 10th, 10th of September, 42, they did a raid on there. Anyway, they, they uh, not to go into too much detail on that, they overran their supply up and destroyed a lot of their um, supplies. And that was Kawaguchi's main supply base. They destroyed some of his artillery, all his supplies. So they didn't have any, any food, just was on their carrying. So their logistics was cut off. And then once he did the raid, they moved back to the, the Lunga perimeter in their, in their boats, the, the Marines. Well, Kawaguchi, instead of, he was, some of his commanders said, let's turn back and, and fight these guys. He goes, not, let's continue on with our plan. So Edson came back and he spoke, him and the, um, Thomas was the chief of staff, spoke to the division commander, says, look, these guys, we know there are about 3,000 of them, or four, three or 4,000 are moving through the jungle. The division commander thought they were going to hit them on the same um, flank that October 21st with the Alligator Creek, they were going to hit us there again. But Thomas and Edson says, no, if I was that commander, I would attack straight out of the jungle. And then once the scouts said they started to turn and go into the jungle, so they're coming this way. The only way they could really sell it to the division commander, Edson says, look, you know, my troops are a bit tired. Can we at least move up on that uh, bloody ridge? Um, and at that stage, the 1st Marine Division had moved their command post up on bloody ridge to get away from the V-ring, they call it, like the center ring, because every day the Japanese were bombing the area around Henderson. And the first Marine Division headquarters were very near Henderson. So they, they moved his headquarters up on the ridge. He says, can we move up on the ridge just to be your bodyguards at least or give my guys a bit of a rest? They go, yeah, move them up there. So they moved up there. Um, they were there for about three or four hours resting. And then Edson says, start digging in. So the you know, Marine Raiders says, oh, this you know, hell of a rest area we got here. So they started digging in what limited supply or supplies they had like a few strands of barbed wire and then and it's all coral region. So they didn't dig too deep. And um, he set his guys up in the line 
and he, and he waited for the Japanese. And then the Japanese at that stage didn't know the Marines were up there. I think some of their scouts that went up in the reconnaissance planes were flying over and they probably seen, yep, there are some Marines here. So instead of tacking up and over, what we'll do, we'll, 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 we'll flank them. Infiltration, we'll go around them and cut them off and then go by the Lunga River and, and cut them off and hit the airfield that way. So on the night of the 13th and 14th, yep, 13th and 14th, um, Kawaguchi only had one battalion ready to go. You know, everyone, was, uh, a couple of them were like ran at each other. Other ones were lost in the jungle. And you only had one ready to go. Um, now, the day before, the, the Japanese would bomb Henderson. But the day before, they actually dropped some bombs actually on um, Bloody Ridge itself, or Edson's Ridge. And that, that's another thing. Let the Marines know, okay, they are coming because they've started bombing the ridge now. So <clears throat> I think 30 minutes before the assault, uh, the Japanese had a, a couple of cruisers and some destroyers. You know, they'd come through every night, they'd drop supplies off, and they'd swing by the Marine positions and bombard so the Marine Tokyo positions. Tokyo Express? Yeah. And the, and the rat runs, they called them too. The Japanese called them rat runs, the Marines called them yeah. Tokyo Express. And they'd come in and they'd, they'd put the spotlights on um, Edson's Ridge itself, and they started bombarding it a bit. A lot of it was overshooting, actually, the ridge and hitting in the assembly areas of the Japanese, so they weren't doing the Japanese that, that good. But um, Kawaguchi, he committed, he was, he already committed to the assault. So one battalion of his three was only assaulted that night. So they managed to go around the Marines flank and C Company, the Raiders, they overran C Company. Um, and they were in like platoon size elements, outposts, and they, they pushed them back a bit. And then daylight came and the Marines, and they were in the jungle. And Edson knew there were 3,000. He only knew about six or 700 attack. He thought, well, they're coming back tonight. So he was, he, his line was kind of like that, and it was refused a bit, and he had three lines. And he said, if the Japanese attack with all they got, they're going to cut my two companies, um, um, cut them out or surround them. So what he did, he moved his front line back to his second line. He had three lines. Moved back to the second line about 400 yards. That opened up about 150 yards. If you see my videos, you'll see about 150 yards of open terrain. And then the Marines had brought their artillery up. I mean, their artillery was like a real dominating factor. That was one of the reasons the Japanese attacked it, not to try to lessen the Marines' firepower, but it didn't work. Um, so they brought 75 millimeter battery up. They had 105 105s by the airfield, and they were ready to go. And they pre-registered all the fires, all the, all the, the sites. Everything was pre-registered. They were waiting for the Japanese the second night. So at that stage, Marine Raiders had the first Marine paratroopers attached to them to form one battalion because they were pretty much decimated. They'd lost a lot of casualties at um, Gavutu, the pair, the pair of guys, but they formed them in one battalion, about 800 guys all up. So second night, the Japanese attacked with two battalions straight up, um, and they did multiple assaults. Their third battalion was out of the fight, almost the whole fight. I think they committed maybe one company, maybe two companies if that. But once again, Kawaguchi, he didn't have all his, all his three battalions ready to go. Yeah, he was stuck and in the, the jungle the whole time. <laughs> oh yeah, it was very frustrating for him. He's just most frustrated he's been in his life. So they attacked piecemeal and they did multiple assaults. The Marines finally moved back to the last uh, Hill 2, Edson's command post, and they formed the ring around that. And then, and, you know, the artillery was just smashing the Japanese, the Marines grenades, the Marines, you know, holding their, because um, they were raiders, you know, they were, they were pretty good troops, so they were holding the ground. They, they held, they very, barely held, but they held when daylight came. Well, the Japanese diversionary attacks, you had one uh, with the Kuma Battalion, you know, they attacked across a, a field at the Overland Trail, and they were basically stopped. Uh, the next day, the Marines, just the most tank, tank um, casualties that had in the, the campaign, the Marines took a tank platoon. I think it had six, six including the lieutenant uh, command tank, attacked across the field, unsupported by infantry. The Japanese had some 47 and 37 millimeter anti-tank guns. Took out two tanks very quickly, and another Marine tank dropped into the Tenaru River. And they all drowned. So the Marines lost three tanks real quick in that campaign, in that bit. But the other one was attack on um, L Company of 3-5, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marine, L Company Ridge. So anyone's ever been there, it's where the golf course is now. So they attacked there, Colonel Oka. And once again, they attacked up a ridge and they were, they were uh, beaten back quite quickly too. So all three assaults, all three were, were failures. 
And then Kawaguchi, instead of going back to Taboo Point, he had to go back the other way. So he went back to the Matanikau, which is out to the west, and without no supplies or any food. And he lost a lot of guys in the jungle. Yeah, um, it was a bad one. They had to pick up the wounded. They left all their equipment because they were starving to death, and they were getting picked off a bit too. Well, I think um, about six to 700 Japanese died um, at Bloody Ridge. You know how many died in the jungle? You know, Marines had about 150 casualties. And in fact, it was the closest, you know, the great historian Richard Frank, Guadalcanal um, historian, said this is probably the closest, in his opinion, that the battle, the Marines ever came to losing the battle. Because if they yeah. would have pushed through with thousands of um, Japanese and took the airfield, once the Marines lost the airfield, then it would have been hard to, you know. Especially uh, given the naval battles that happened after, because it was swing, things were swinging in the ocean after this one. And depending how the Japanese even did with that, consolidating the Solomon Islands could have been a real an opportunity. It would have happened, maybe. Yeah. Exactly. But Bloody Ridge um, is very, um, very important in the Pacific campaign. Because at that stage, that's where the Japanese high command, in fact, the, the day after Bloody Ridge, Japanese high command in Tokyo had an emergency meeting. And they worked out that, okay, the Marines are here to stay. Um, there's probably more than we anticipated. And the Americans have kind of like drew a la line in the sand and said, we're going to be fighting for this island. So the Japanese couldn't maintain two um, main thrusts at that stage, one being PNG or, or Papua New Guinea and the other one being Guadalcanal. So what they did at that time, they said, Papua New Guinea and Port Moresby is not our main objective anymore. Our main objective will be Guadalcanal. So any resources, any supplies, any reinforcements we have going into PNG with the Port Moresby and the Kokoda, everything now goes to Guadalcanal. And they told the South Seas commander on the Kokoda who could actually see the lights of Port Moresby. I mean, they were pretty decimated at that stage and they're waiting for the 35th Brigade, which just got wiped out basically in Guadalcanal to reinforce them. So they told that commander, all right, withdraw and hold in place as best you can. As soon as we wipe these Americans out of Guadalcanal, we will send all our reinforcements to you. But then that gave the Australians, especially when they get in their uh, regular forces back, enough time to regroup and to, to push back over the Kokoda. And then um, it's a big what if. What if, you know, there was 40, almost 40,000 Japanese was, was pumped into Guadalcanal. You know, what if they had been pumped into PNG? You know, they were probably took Port Moresby. I don't know, it's a big what if, a lot of what ifs. But that was a big, that, that's why Bloody Ridge is a very important battle, not alone just for Guadalcanal, but for the um, Kokoda campaign at the same time. It affected yeah. quite a bit. Japanese High um, Command said this is now going to be a decisive battle. Well, Canal is important. It changed a lot. Yeah, it did. So you can say, I probably don't know how long we went, but I, I you know. But then the cat, I like the cat got bored, he ran off there. I'm not playing with him. Um, so that's, you can see I could go off in different little tracks um, to cover each in detail. Um, so yeah. I, that's, that's, that's Alligator Creek and Bloody Ridge. So I took them up at the Marines, they're, they're at the stage now. So it's September the, the 14th or 15th to the end of Bloody Ridge. And the first big resupply the Marines had came in September the 18th. It was a major reinforcement of supply, and it brought in a very, very uh, fresh and, and very good unit, which was the 7th Marine Regiment. So the whole division was, a, was entirely um, together. And it also gave Vandegriff a chance, fresh troops. He could, um, I guess, um, garrison or man his uh, Premier 360, and plus it gave him uh, room to do the, go on the offensive a bit. So he knew there was a lot of a few Japanese near the Matanikau River, which was a few miles to the west. And he wanted to wipe those guys out and push them back. He wanted to keep the Japanese way away from Matanikau uh, to, to uh, preserve the airfield. So it, it, it gave him a chance. This is when Chesty Puller and the rest of them landed on the 17th of um, August. And the poor paramount, not poor, but the depleted parachute battalion at that stage, as soon as the 7th uh, Marines landed on the 18th, they put the battalion parachute guys on those same transports on the way out. I think they were down like 25% of the original force. But the Raiders were still there. You know, and they thought they were going to go away with the para battalions, but they still, you know, they still had things in store for the Raiders, unfortunately, for those guys. And it got a lot scarier with the losses from the Navy. <laughs> oh, yeah. The Navy, a lot of naval, big surprises. <laughs> well, naval campaigns, you know, you had seven major naval, naval battles around Guadalcanal. 
it just... everybody everybody focuses on uh, you know midway but just alone in the solomon islands the naval battles are extremely intense and then later on in history you got letty gulf which is the by far the craziest mm -hmm. naval battle yeah. we talk about the naval aviators too you know some people say the naval aviators of the japanese were destroyed at midway and no, nowhere close the six-month campaign in solomon islands destroyed the 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 Japanese naval one, it, I forgot, it was almost 600 something planes, the Japanese lost in the Guadalcanal campaign it's, and, it's and most of its crews too. It's Very experienced naval crews. Because yeah. you would say that the Japanese had a tactical victory when they took out uh, the USS Wasp or, or Saratoga and stuff. But in essence, they had lost so much of their veteran aviators that couldn't be replaced. And the Americans were just pumping out every year entire fleets and trained personnel. So Japanese were just getting dwindled down. No, exactly, exactly. And that was, you know, the Battle of Attrition, that was what the Guadalcanal was, the attrition campaign. And, you know, we're only up to September. So I know you guys are about to cover Guadalcanal too, and you're going a lot more detail, especially about the naval. You know, and in Guadalcanal, Guadalcanal was the first time you had a naval air and land campaign at such a large scale in military history. Yeah. You know, simultaneously at once. It was the first time in especially U.S. military history where you had um, – the forces working together. Look at the Cactus Air Force. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a classic. Um, we had naval, um, U.S. Army at that stage, one Air Force, but U.S. Army Air Force and and Marine aviators fighting together. And, and you know, a hybrid unit was fought quite well together. Yeah, well, the Americans, the Army and the Navy fought well together. The Japanese did a good job of fighting each other. <laughs> for most oh of the yes, war. exactly. Well, I mean, Legendary. Americans had. I mean, the Allies, the U.S. had that too, especially with the. You know the the high command. I wouldn't say the lower command, but the high command fought each other. And just a bit of a, well, I'm thinking about it too. The U.S. Army was at Guadalcanal. In fact, there was more U.S. Army at Guadalcanal than U.S. Marine in the end. But the U.S. Army didn't really come in until October. Yeah. And really, really, you know, obviously they set the stage in in December, January, in the big campaigns around there when the Japanese did finally go on the defensive. You know, the thin red line and all that the movies depict. Yeah. I haven't seen the thin red line in so long. Oh my god! Oh, don't don't get me started on it. It, it. The part where the um, it depicts uh, supposed to depict where Charles Davis earned the Medal of Honor, you know, attacking a bunker and, and the actor in the in the modern they made like two movies the thin red line the modern one with John Cusack, he plays loosely plays uh, Captain Davis. Yeah, that's probably the most pres perfectly preserved battlefield on Guadalcanal. It's called a galloping horse battlefield. No one lives on it. It's, I think, one hut. But anyway, I could, I could talk forever, so I think we're getting on a bit. <laughs> yeah, uh, this has been a great episode. I think we have to do this again soon. Yeah, well, like I said, we're up to September the 17th or 18th. Yeah, we can cover, uh, well, I mean, I'll leave it up to you and your decisions, what you like, uh, what you're interested the most in. But uh, certainly still a lot to be said about Guadalcanal. Still got the fight for Henderson Field that's going to be raging on. And uh, the starvation of the Japanese until they finally leave. Yeah, the next big, big battle is about Henderson Field. That's the, that's the last Japanese offensive, I think, in the whole Pacific War. Yeah. Battle of Henderson Field in October. Then you got the, the Americans attacking in Mount Austin fights in January, February. That one's not talked about as much. No, because everyone thinks, you know, everyone, when I say everyone, I don't mean everyone, but a lot of people, you know, the popular, I guess, history of Guadalcanal is the Marines are there. After the first Marine division left and after four months, that was it. But, you know, second Marine division, a lot of people don't even know the second Marine division was there. Second Marine division fought in, in you know, in the entirety. It, it shoots to Peleliu real quick when it comes to, even most books you read, it uh, shoots right to Peleliu and goes from there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much uh, for this interview. And if you like, uh, please tell the audience again, you know, more about your YouTube channel so they know where to check out your stuff. Yeah, it's um, maybe you'll put it in the link or, or not link. But, I will, um, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's called Guadalcanal Walking the Battlefield. And it's on YouTube. It's just Guadalcanal Walking the Battlefield. And the Facebook's the same one. And at this stage, I think I have like 38 videos. And I'm about to release the Getchy Patrol. So if you want to know about the Getchy Patrol mm -hmm. in in detail, I can, um, I've almost got that ready to release. I'll probably be recording it 
tomorrow, the next day. I've got it, all the slides and things ready to go. And a lot of then and now photos. I've got some photos of the Getcha area from the 18th of April, or sorry, 18th of August. You know, the, the, a few days after it actually occurred when the Marines went in after these guys. So I'm about to do that one. I just did Lima Company Ridge. I just talked about there, diversionary attack. I did both diversionary attacks. And I think I got three videos just on Bloody Ridge itself. And I covered the Medal of Honor ones, uh, the Barcelona position, which is uh, the most popular one. Yeah. Page. Well, yeah, Barcelona is going to be the all-star of every man. Yeah. yeah, so I go down into the positions where he earned his Medal of Honor. And we talk a bit about Barcelona there. But yeah, that's, that's where you can find it. Just Guadalcanal, walking a battlefield. Perfect. So go check him out, everybody. And uh, well, this has been the Pacific War podcast week by week, uh, over and out.